Um, but we won't formally get started. But because um, I have so, you know, I know you run, you know, Healthy Surprise, Jumbo Superfoods, and also uh, the Dirt Paleo Personal Care. Um, but your Facebook uh, pictures hook, you know, suck me in. I did a lot of research for this. And so yeah. I have to ask about the, um, you're, you're, you're smiling already, the OM Practice Club. Yeah. Sure. Tell me about that. Well, what do you know about it? I, I don't know much at all. I just saw it in like a little a provocative picture. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to, you know, see what it is. And all I saw was, okay, it's a yoga class. And then I'm like, what's OM? And then I look what OM is and it says orgasmic meditation. So I'm like, all right, I have to ask them what this is. Well, this would be probably good for the show because um, people love risky sex stuff. But uh, <laughs> orgasmic meditation is a... It's a practice and like a branded thing that uh, I, for, I don't know the exact lady, but but some lady developed, and it basically they've they've taken this um, like this concept of sex and they've kind of put it into a box and made this very specific practice that they call oming orgasmic meditation. Okay, and they kind of have a not. I get. I like the pun. I gotcha. Yeah. Right, and they have a, a non-conventional definition of orgasm hmm. um, compared to what most people they would say that most people consider orgasm to be what we what, what they would refer to as climax which is kind of like the uh, uh but they look at it as like this whole bigger a bigger scope of it hmm. and <clears throat> they think that um well their their model of oming is where uh a woman lays down yeah. in a nest that is constructed by the by the man or Another woman. It's like a nest. What is the nest made up of? A nest mm-hmm. is uh, a little safe and secure area for the practice. Okay. I'm That's picturing typically- like wrappers of healthy surprise, like you make this nest of – no. That would just make it better. Right. <laughs> you can do that. But um, it's uh, usually like a yoga mat and some pillows. Okay. And you know, just kind of like a little comfortable area to, to practice with. And then the man – they've got some protocols to kind of go through it so it's – it's kind of structured and it, um, it's a group know, class movies. though, right? It's like, what? it's a group class. Like there's multiple people or is this done in the practice of your own home? <clears throat> Both. So, oh. so oming is a practice between two people and then they have what, uh, you saw, which is the Om practice club, which is kind of like a, uh, organized meeting of, of practitioners of oming okay. that can come together and find other partners and practice together. But I didn't get to what it is. Yeah, go it's ahead. It's essentially pussy stroking. Really? But they would refer to it colloquially. Yeah, and it's um, it's 15 minutes of like a very specific but not very complicated uh, stroking of the clitoris. Wow. And this you do this in a group, like uh, a room full of people. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So was that hard at first to like be in a room full of people in this intimate, you know, with your significant other or no? Um, by the time I got to the Ohm class session yeah. environment, uh, it wasn't really hard for me because I, I've been doing work uh, by myself and my partner and kind of yeah. sexual exploration and, and enlarging my my idea of what is uh, like shameless sex. I think our culture has a huge, huge amount of, of baggage and shame. It just kind of puts on everybody about sex. Right. And I've been working for a long time to kind of diffuse that and untangle that in my own brain. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, for me, it wasn't like a big deal. Hmm. But, you know, you go to one of these kind of like first time ohm classes where they bring on a bunch of people who have never been there before. And, you know, on the one hand, it's people that are at a ohm class so right. they're not exactly the most prudish people that they, they kind of know what they're getting into a little bit yeah but yeah. but that's about it though they're not like you know like porn stars that are like super experienced in this so right. it, it tends to be people that are right on the edge and uh, yeah. uh for a lot of them it's it can be very terrifying yeah. um or just like very intense experience to see kind of like a group sex yeah uh, environment so wow for me, it wasn't. It's not too big of a deal, but it can be intense for a lot of people. Yeah. See, I never thought in a million years this is the direction of where this our conversation would go. But you know, the, you have so many fascinating pictures and hobbies. Like I have to bring some of this stuff up because I find it really interesting. And there's also a picture with you in in a room 
it almost looks like a temple with skulls. You okay. know what I'm referring to? What is that? The, so the skulls are on a table, right? Yeah, there's skulls are on a table. There's like skulls or some bones. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. Um, so that uh, that was a shamanic psychedelic uh, ceremony that I attended in Peru. Um, I mean... So what was that like? Well, whatever you kind of are conjuring with the pictures... Yeah, yeah. It was like 10 thousand times more intense uh than what it looks like it was a, it was a, a very very amazing profound experience i was very lucky to participate in did you go there knowing that's what you're going to do or were you just traveling in peru and you stumbled upon this i i my friend uh aubrey marcus invited me down hmm. to i've heard to- of aubrey yeah 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 so he uh invited me to go with him um and some other people down to peru to meet this shaman that he uh, really likes, this guy Don Howard, who's incredible. Hmm. And, you know, Aubrey's a seasoned guy, and I trust him. And he said, look, you got to come down here and see what this guy's cooking up. Right. And I didn't, you know, I didn't need to go much deeper than that. I mean, I, I knew the medicines that this guy worked with. Yeah. But I didn't really expect to be in the, you know, temples of the, of the temples of doom with like, <laughs> skulls it literally looks like that that killed people and jaguar skulls and it was you know yeah it was it was super crazy and intense man and 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 that's you know while you're on some of the most powerful psychedelics in the world and uh the reason that those images are so evocative to us and like powerful is because they are you know i mean there's there's a reason that the skulls are charged so with a very seasoned practitioner like this guy and the right medicine um I mean, these things converge to create a very, very powerful experience. Yeah. So what did you, what realizations or, you know, thoughts came after that experience for you? Because that seems like a life-changing, once-in-a-lifetime type of experience. Yeah, it's both of those things, yeah. sure. Um, I had so many, man. I mean, so many different things uh came out of that but if i had to i mean after that do you write in a journal like to get everything down like what's your what do you do so you don't forget all these things that are running through your head well you forget a lot of them yeah uh, because that's the nature of the experience i mean almost like dreaming that you can't bring it all back right and when you do very powerful psychedelic uh you know medicines that create these kind of mystical states the experience that I have and I think a lot of people share is that the immensity of the experience, it's so profound and so overwhelming and so the bandwidth is so, so much that when you return here to, you know, the default consensus reality, right. uh, words seem like like a insufficient trivial way to try to describe you can't it. You know, express like it. one word after the other you know mm. it's like if uh, you went onto a web page and downloaded a web page today like the New York Times it might be like a 50 megabyte file for like all the images and all these things and then if you were like okay now, now I want you to describe those 50 megabytes to me in human language like right. one word after the other I mean, it's just like, it seems so inconsequential. You know, I'm going to be here for, for six years like, reading off like a million <laughs> descriptors, you know? Right. So you come back and someone's like, what's it like? And you're just kind of right. God, you know? I, I think that's why a lot of people say they, they see angels or they see the divine because we don't really have good language around these experiences. And no. uh, you know, the Eskimos have like 50 words for snow. Right. Um, We've got like God. So when you have this, the immensity of this experience, you know, for some people that means it's a guy in a robe who's judging you. For for the Buddhists, you know, it means just a, a sense of contentment. The Taoists would say it's where everything's growing from. I mean, there's all different ways to kind of slice this idea of of everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, what about from? A, um, we'll make it easier, right? Anything from a business standpoint that struck you that you went in and did in your business because of this experience? <clears throat> hmm. 
from a business standpoint. I mean, the, one of the biggest takeaways from, from that kind of work is that this here, this life that we're in right now, mm-hmm. is really like a, it's, it's a game and I feel it's like a buffet of pleasures. You know, like if I go to Whole Foods and I walk around and there's like 20,000 different foods and things and each of them tastes different and all of them taste good, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, for most people, you know, everything, yeah. everyone likes everything, but it's it's almost blissful to be able to, to have all of these different, you know, tastes and flavors and and I look at business as an extension of, of that of that theory that, you know, we're typically told by the culture that, you know, you work and like you do this job and it kind of sucks. And then after a long time of it sucking, you're going to retire. So you're going to stop doing the sucky thing and then you're going to do what you really want to do. Right. And that's the more conventional narrative. Whereas uh, for myself, um, I look at, uh, you know, business is a way to do fun things that normally I wouldn't ever be able to do. So for example, um, you know, I, I don't know you too well, but I don't think people could just write you a check and say, Hey, you, you know, I, I've been a, a floor sweeper for the last, you know, 50 years, but I want to be on your show. Like, that's not really interesting. You're not going to really want to have that person on there just because they say, Hey, I'm going to give you money. So right, right. Uh, in order to have these kind of like real cool experiences, like winning a Grammy or, you know, jumping on, out of a, like that guy who did the, like jumped out of the highest balloon ever <laughs> or going to the show or meet musicians or, you know, per, travel the world and tour as a rock star. Those are all things you do because of like professional achievement and the, you know, from that standpoint, as opposed to just like working. So yeah. when you go back and for me, having that kind of real, uh, per, big, it gives you a lot of perspective of like what's going on and what's important and, and how the, the little things can be trivial. So coming back to that, I kind of try to bring that back to me as much as I can. Was when you're here, you know, we're scared of a lot of things. I'm going to run out of money. My girlfriend's not going to love me. You know, I'm going to get hit by a car. There's all these these problems and things we we wrap ourselves with normally, uh, and it's easy for to forget. Uh, yeah. for me yeah. and for everybody that, hey, you know what, maybe the point of being here is to have fun and try to explore all the the pleasures that are available to us. Yeah. So it gave you a huge sense of perspective in general. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. yeah. Um, you know, and the other thing is I saw, I don't even know, it's you with a gun. Um, I don't know if it's in Africa or something. Yeah. Sure. Was that uh, one of your travel escapades also? Yeah, I've been all over. Yeah, I've done a lot of traveling. Um, that was I did a, a safari in uh, Kenya. Hmm. Uh, as I was working my way down to Tanzania, where I I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, so I, I spent some hmm. time in Africa. And actually, my time in Africa was where I learned the word jambo, which is which is the greeting in Swahili. It's hello. It's a hmm. very fun word. Everyone's jambo, jambo, jambo. So that's where the that name came jambo, from. Jambo, got it. Yeah. Yeah, but that specific photograph was at a uh, game reserve, like a national park in, I believe it was Tanzania or Kenya, and uh, that was one of the, um, I don't know, like uh, game warden is really the, maybe the, the word, but it was one of the guys who like, you know, protects the elephants, and they're all mm. armed to the teeth because the, uh, the poachers are all armed too, so it's like a full-on war, and you know... Yeah, I heard a little bit about this. It's super dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it's very dangerous down there. Wow. Um, so where were you at? What business were you running at the time or what were you doing in business when you went to, to Kenya? Well, Kenya, I was um, I was working with my father. So I was in the construction world and that was kind of like a lifetime ago. I was I was living in Florida. I was on the East Coast. And that trip really was one of the things that got me to really kind of examine what I was doing and what I wanted to do with my life. I did a lot of journaling, and I realized uh, on that trip that, you know, working in this, uh, you know, working for my father um, and kind of being groomed to take over this business was like a fantastic opportunity, and, and it was a wonderful business. And in a lot of ways, it would have been easier than kind of like, what I did, which was basically pack up everything in my truck and drive out to California. Right. Um, but, you know, 
as much as that kind of what would have been a, like an easier, cushier thing, I just realized it wasn't for me. I needed to go out and kind of break out and be my own man and, and do my own thing. And now looking back, you know, three businesses later and all these crazy experiences that we're talking about, I think it was the right decision right. and to stay, you know, in my hometown and, and work right. in the family business. Yeah. So did you go, what made you decide to go to Africa in the first place? Were you trying to contemplate this type of life change or? Well, in this instance, this trip that we're talking about, it was my second trip to Africa. Mm, oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, no, wait, no, no, no. I'm sorry. It was my second trip to India. Mm. What happened was I, I spent some time in India a while ago, maybe 10 years, 15 years ago now. I spent like two, almost two months there. And my brother, like five years ago, or my God, now maybe 10 years ago, uh, he, he had a business partner in, in Delhi, and his business, business partner was getting married. And I had been all over the world, you know, at this point, I mean, you know, 20, 30 countries. But my brother had only been in maybe like Mexico. And He's like, parents, I need you, brother. I need you to guide me. No, no, no. Yeah. Exactly. But yeah. my parents said, hey, we don't want, your, you know, Matt to go abroad, you know, and I'm saying by himself, he's, he's younger than me and said, you know, you've been all over. Will you, mm. will you go with him? Yeah. And I said, no, I won't go because India, you know, parts of it are, I don't want to disparage India, but some of the cities are really dirty and gross and Delhi specifically. I mean, it was bad back then. I think now it's maybe the most polluted city in the world. Mm. And the idea of, you know, traveling 20, 30 hours to go to like the, one of the most polluted cities in the world was not really something I was going to do in my life at that point. Right. And they said, you know, please, you know, go with them. And I said, well, I said, that scared, that but- scared him even more, Joe, by the way. <laughs> you're like, <laughs> <laughs> you're a very adventurous, but you're like, I won't go there. So, yeah, well, it wasn't that it was dangerous. It was just, it was just gross. Yeah. Um, but I said, you know what? Okay. I'll go as long as it's, it's in part of like a bigger adventure. Mm. Right. Yeah. So then <clears throat> I decided, okay, what would be a badass adventure to do? I'm going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Mm. And then, you know, then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm going to be in Africa. I might as well do the safari. So then the Africa thing kind of became the sun. It was like the center of the solar system. And then the India trip was like an ancillary mm. part of it, you know? So in that way, I kind of justified to myself, okay, I'm already going to go all the way across the world to go to Africa. Then we'll just shoot over to Delhi for a couple of days and do the wedding. Right. Yeah. And your was your brother's eyes really opened after that experience? Because if he's only been to Mexico and then you take him on this African trip and then to India. Yeah, man. I, I mean, it, it'd be really hard for any any Western American or American Western Western American or mm-hmm. uh, no, any American Westerner to to go to the, to Africa and go to a couple countries and then go to India and not have your 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 perspective um enlarged I, I mean i've been all over on that trip what was really interesting was that the gentleman who's getting married he was upper class the brahmin and the wedding was you know like this upper class brahmin wedding yeah. and uh they just had so many so many people like working and like doing things for them that mm. were you would never do it in america because even though like minimum wage, it's still like, it's still expensive, you know, but there's so many people there and they're so inexpensive that the thing that struck me was that they had this parade with fireworks and like elephants and, you know, marching band. I mean, it was like this massive parade that, that marched like, you know, a half mile or something, but along the whole marching route, there were Indian men in full dress and it wasn't cool out it was hot like in these you know kind of like steward outfits holding these big lamps and they were like big lamps you'd see in like a you know convention hall or like maybe someone's like formal dining room and they just had like extension cords like strung along along mm. you know along the whole way and there were these dudes just sitting there like for hours just holding these lamps and there were so many of them and it just kind of gave me this context of like wow like I'm at the rich dude's wedding who's got elephants and fireworks and like, you know, his bride was like in a litter with jewels all over. And then there was like a thousand of these like mm-hmm. untouchable slaves basically. And, you know, right or wrong, 
no judgment on that. I'm just saying that like to see that definitely changes your perspective. You know, you yeah. come back to the yeah. States and you're like, okay, wow, that's just a totally different culture over there. Yeah. yeah. So Joe, where's your next trip, trip. to? Uh, well, now with work um, and everything, I'm traveling constantly. Some of them are more exciting than others. I, I just was in Oakland and Denver. <laughs> You're like Africa, Oakland. Let me see. Yeah. So, so those ones aren't um, right. too crazy. Uh, but on the more crazy side, I, I'm hoping to get down to Peru again hmm. um, in the summer uh, to go drink some ayahuasca. So that will be another. That was a little. We'll be, I'll have some more. Some more meat to, to to fling to your readers when I get back. You know, I just interviewed. Uh, I don't know if you heard of Wim Hof before. So he, um, yeah. So he, because it made me think of we were talking about Mount Kilimanjaro, and he's taking like twenty eight people to the summit in just their shorts and shoes or something. So maybe. Yeah, uh, so, so when I summited it, yeah. I was wearing like seven like jackets on. I mean, really? I had a, I, it was almost like a space suit. You had so much clothes because. It's so cold when you're up there, yeah. and then the top of it is a glacier, right? And you climb up, and it takes hours and hours and hours, and it's like minus twenty degrees up on the on the top of it, right? So to go up there in your in your shorts, you know that's uh, you know, but he's the Hoff; he can do it exactly. You know, there was one um, where you went to Dixie Elixir. Um, yeah. I just noticed. So tell me, what are some of the takeaways from that? Because you, you said, um, I think in the post that it's the world's largest infused edible company. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that there's like a Forbes ranking, but <laughs> I think they've raised about, and you know, someone can right. go check this, but I, I yeah. think it's you know, 20, 30, 40 million dollars, yeah. a huge amount of capital. We'll say it's one, one of the ones up there. So, but yeah. But yeah. I, I I try to I'm in a position now where I got to be careful about my okay. words because, like, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later. But but with that with healthy surprise and the health claims, you know, if you say something's vegan, the the vegans, you know, they know. But um, so Dixie, uh, I mean, will probably be interesting to a lot of the, the listeners is that if you go to Colorado and you uh, spend any time with with people that are in the industry or go to any of the places. Um, they're just so like, it's not a big deal. Like it's just another day at work right. and like, yeah, it's a plant or, you know, chopping this one down or putting right. it in cardboard boxes and we're, you know, doing accounting and HR and it's just like, whatever. But when I go back home to Florida, uh, which is where I'm from yeah, and I tell people I'm in the cannabis business, you know, they, they, their heads shrink a little bit. They, they look around and they can't cannabis and they're, they're, their voices drop in a little hushed tones. <laughs> and, uh, it's just such a different And you world. open your coat up and you're like, do you want any of the... No. <laughs> <laughs> um, only in places where it's legal to do that. Right. I, right. Would, I would never <laughs> do that in a state where uh, you know, it was illegal. But um, yeah, there's the fact that, which the, that people are operating with such comfort and at such scale. You know, um, I've, I've started quite a few businesses. Uh, I've raised some money. Um, but... You know, raising tens of millions of dollars, building out a multi-million dollar facility. You know, it's it's that's a big it's a big scale. I mean, I, don't know, I think they have like fifty to hundred employees. Yeah. So they're 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 operating a cannabis business at scale. And, and what's cool about that is that I don't think it's really ever been done before. You know, in, in a legal fashion. I mean, I'm sure the cartels operate, but unless you seem like Breaking Bad or something, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say legally. Um, so what's neat is that they're, you know, they're trailblazing it. Uh, one of the things that's yeah. real fun and uh, very difficult in being in the cannabis space is that there are there are no mentors, there's no trailblazers, mm. nobody on it. You know, you can't even call a lawyer and say like, hey, you know, what do we know, do? Federal law says no, and the state law says yes, and like, what does it mean? Nobody knows, you know, and. I'm this little. I'm not going to be able to use this spiel anymore. Maybe in a year or two, because people are starting to know, and it's starting to get figured out. But, and I've been in it for a couple of years now, and it's just, it's it's just so murky, and so you just got to keep going forward. Which is a meta uh, lesson in business, as I'm sure you know. I mean, it's the entrepreneurial challenge, but it's like, it's it's like 10x in the cannabis space because you have all this risk. There's a lot of legal, you know, it's not clear legally. 
and stuff like that. Well, it's not. Yeah, it's not clear. Yeah. You don't have access to the to the post office. You don't have access to the banking system. You don't have access to a lot of um, t- you know talent. Capital is very very difficult to get. Um, so I mean, there's a lot of challenges that make it even even more difficult. But yeah. so these guys in Dixie, you know, they fought through. I mean, we're fighting through it, but but they fought through it, and um, that was kind of inspiring just to see, you know, that it's happening. It's happening at a big level. Yeah. And so, were you going there too for market research purposes for Jumbo Superfoods? <clears throat> um, yeah. I mean, we're we're growing and. Uh, our our hope and vision is to be able to operate a facility, um, hopefully in California, where we can be as let's say compliant as they are. So you know they're operating this big thing, lots of employees, and they're not worried about you know the SWAT team coming in and arresting everybody and doing all that. Um, California, uh, and you know we can go as deep into the to the details of it as you want. Yeah, go ahead. It. Yeah, but there's all kinds of different conflicting rules and laws, and it's created uh, what they in the industry they literally call California the wild wild west. It's almost like the, the industry term, and they almost disparagingly like Colorado is like you know they get it all figured out, and they're using the, they have the rules or whatever, and it's like all these crazy you know cowboys in California because there's not a lot of law, there's not a lot of regulation. Um, and there's conflicting stuff. So, so California can go in and anyone can buy it, right? Because I think I believe in Illinois, I'm in Chicago. Oh, you can't. No, um, you can't. So California has a uh, has a medical marijuana program in mm. place for about 20 years now, and pretty much anybody can go get a, a doctor's recommendation. You you need so, a doctor's prescription. You need a doctor's recommendation. And um, they're not particularly difficult to get, you know. Uh, it's pretty much if you can find that the plant is beneficial to you, yeah. And you don't have any contraindicating, you know, things, yeah. uh, and you're not crazy, and you know the doctor doesn't think you're gonna, you're, 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 uh, you know, a risk to yourself. Then yeah, you can get a recommendation and you can go get it. Um, it's still controlled and there's a framework, but you know, there's like for example. Uh, in the state of California, we've got about 11 pages of law divided among maybe like four or five different documents. So there's like a two-page bulletin from the um, – I forget the name – but the revenue department that like collects the taxes and, and they, they did a bulletin like about how to pay taxes. And then the attorney general under Schwarzenegger issued like a seven-page bulletin of about like – how your corporation should be set up and some of the rules and the way that he interprets it. Then we've got like a paragraph from the constitutional amendment in the 90, like 94. We've got SB 420, which is like two or three paragraphs. So in aggregate, when you put all the law together, you've got, you know, like 10 pages of guidance. So, okay, 10 pages. It's not like 10 words. I mean, it's got some stuff in there. But the word edibles never mentioned in anything, Yeah. right? So that's just not even listed. Now, if we go to Colorado... Uh, I think they got like a hundred pages just on edibles. You know what I mean? Mm. About testing them and labeling, and you know how many milligrams and da 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 da. Right. So they got this whole uh, corpus of you know regulation and guidance and how to be compliant and pay your taxes, whatever. Whereas in California, it's very gray because it's clearly legal to do. <clears throat> it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. There's over a thousand dispensaries, possibly in LA alone. So I mean, you're talking about a huge business. Thousands, tens of thousands of people are involved in it. Lots of money moving. Right. Um, right. But yet, some people are getting arrested. Some stores are getting closed down. And wow. It's just like people don't really understand why. I've been in it for two years. I don't really fully understand them. I, I have some guesses as to why the SWAT teams, you know, smashing people's businesses and stealing all their stuff. Um, but you know, the good news is that as, as, as much as that is where it is, uh, the, the assembly, the California assembly passed, uh, AB 266 and governor Jerry Brown signed it, uh, along with two other bills. And those three together will create, um, like the department of marijuana regulation or whatever they're going to call it. And that will come online in the next couple of years. And then they will be able to craft, you know, a whole series of regulations so we can have our government red tape too. Um, right. I, I say that half-heartedly. I mean, I mean, there needs to be some more regulation than what we have now right. to bring some clarity and, you know, stop these, these silly arrests. 
so that's coming, you know, that's coming. But right now, California is is definitely not as regulated as some of the other states. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, now Healthy Surprise, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, this is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation from inventory management to what products are actually profitable and much more. Today, I'm very excited. We have Joe Winky. He's the founder of three companies, Healthy Surprise, which is a subscription healthy snack box, the Dirt Personal Care Company, which sells high quality personal items. I'm going to have to have you talk about the toothpaste, Joe because I saw the video, it's pretty cool, and Jumbo Superfoods Company, which is high-quality herbal and cannabis-infused edibles. Joe's been featured on the Wall Street Journal, Oprah.com, Playboy.com, many others. Joe, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I want to hear about the low point, the lowest point so far, because you've had three businesses, a lot of journey, and then the proudest moment. Um, So what's been the lowest point for you? Um, the lowest point that, well, I think we touched on it earlier. I, I mean, just when, when cash flow was getting, was getting low and, um, I was kind of running out of money and we were losing customers. Um, you know, that's like a conventional kind of like storyline. Okay. You know, that's the low point. I ran into some problems, um, that maybe your listeners can learn from. And the first one which wasn't the most apparent problem at the time, but I can't stress this enough, was that I didn't charge enough money. Yeah. And, I was going to ask uh, early on, how would you figure out your pricing? Yeah. So I, I marked it up based off of what I thought was like, uh, like if you go to Best Buy and you buy a TV for $100, they probably paid 60 So right. that's kind of like a standard like discount on a lot of stuff. It's a discount uh, on in, in construction fixtures, which was kind of like my history. So if you, someone buys a toilet right. – same kind of model, right. so I thought that kind of markup system would 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 extend over to what I was doing, um, which is not enough. And in fact, uh, with my current portfolio of brands, yeah. we don't come to market if we don't have a five x multiple on the cost of goods. So mm-hmm. if you want to compare this, um, if mm-hmm. we're if we're gonna set if if, if we want to sell a widget for ten dollars. It can't cost us any more than two to make. Right. Whereas with this model, if I was going to sell my healthy surprise box for ten dollars, it'd be costing me six. Um, so that's a tremendous difference. Yeah. And at the time, if someone had told me that you needed to mark up your boxes five x from what you're paying, yeah. one, I would have said what most people say, like that's too much, and I'm ripping people off or whatever, which really is founded in, in naivete because a coke. Coca Cola is costing you 100x markup, and that's what you need to be it's in business. It costs a couple cents for them to make yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I can go, do a whole diatribe on that, but that was one of the main things. Was yeah. I didn't charge enough, and part of that was because you can't charge 5x on healthy food. Groceries have a very low margin, and people have been conditioned by going to their grocery stores for their whole lives right. that they they don't pay a huge amount of money for food. Like food is not one of the things you pay a big yeah. premium on for a right. lot of people. Right. Whereas people want to buy expensive cars and expensive colleges right. for their kids, they don't want to buy expensive potato chips. Right. At least they didn't, you know, five years right. ago when I started it. Yeah. No, I agree. It's like if you buy like a kombucha, right? That's like four dollars. You can get like an entire value meal, like McDonald's, for like the same yeah. exact price. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there's that piece about it, and the charging more, and and I, I, I if people take one thing away from this, if you're if you're selling something and you make it. Charge a lot for it, at least five times, hopefully up to 10x or more. Right. Um, and then the other thing, so that was my mistake, and that was something that I could control a little bit. Yeah. In as much as that I could have charged more, but but at the time, it's hard to charge for food, but whatever. Yeah. And the other thing that I ran into that I, I couldn't really control so much was that, um, you know, I kind of started this category, the subscription snack right. 
food category, which was kind of cool. And other people took notice. And um, I ended up having a bunch of people copy the idea, hmm. which is great and it's fine. And I even had some people like copy our website where like they copy the actual text. Really? You know, like, their description. So, like my name's Joe Winky. I'm the founder. Yeah. <laughs> they literally copy like word for word. I have screenshots. I, I, you know, what is it, my ego? But I have like a little folder on my computer of like screenshots of, of businesses that like, you know, at the time were copying me. I just couldn't believe it. It was, it was so like flattering and kind of gross like simultaneously right. and emotions so there was a bunch of people that copied me and that wasn't the problem the problem was is that they went and raised a lot of capital from it hmm. and that was something i didn't do because hmm. i read this book the four-hour work week and my goal was to have this cash flow business not to build this giant snack empire and i always let that be my guidepost i always wanted I, that was the reason i was doing this it wasn't for the money to become a huge rich venture capitalist guy hmm. But there were people that, that did do this, and some of these companies raised, um, you know, NatureBox, uh, who's still around. I think they raised like twenty nine million dollars. Wow! And that's an abstract number for even me five years ago. Now that I've you know run some businesses and we're doing some big revenues, like to spend to, when you raise money, you don't raise it to put it in the bank and get interest on it. You raise it to spend it to make mm. shit happen, and. The way that this bought, this business works is that if you're raising, say, $30 million, usually the, the VCs don't just come and say, here's your $30 million, like, let us know how it goes. They say, like, okay, here's half a million, and you're at you know, 300 users right now, but when you get to 1,000 users, we'll release another million to you. And then when you get to like 5,000 users, we'll give you a 5 million. Right. And they, right. this is called tranches, and they'll like kind of re release it. Well, the way that these guys set up these deals was that they weren't looking at the, the bottom line profit or loss of for the business because that metric really isn't very important when you're trying to do this like massive, you know, unicorn type startup. So they incentivized the management team at these other snack food businesses to just increase the number of subscribers. They just want growth. That's, they wanted growth. They wanted mm -hmm. more and more boxes shipped. So what happened was these other companies started giving these very big incentives mm. to sign up. And at the peak, my favorite anecdote about this yeah. was yeah. that I signed on to Facebook and ConsciousBox, which is my friend Jameson, he started it. Um, you know, he started it, whatever. He did, he's not there now anymore. But they, I got an ad on Facebook that said three months free if you sign up. And, and then you start buying the boxes and putting their stuff in I, your stuff. No, like, <laughs> Get all your employees to sign up, and then you just put their stuff in your boxes. No. <laughs> well, because you can never. I mean, that's and I crazy. Go into all yeah. the economics of it, and blah blah blah, and whatever the recycle and the you know LTV of the customer and all this stuff. But there's like almost no way to ever make mo make money on that customer yeah. because you got to also pay for all the people who are just signing up and quitting after the three months. And that's such a good deal. You're going to get a lot of those people. So like the people that stay with you are never going to really pay that back. Right. So I called up the guy because I had, I had been seeing you know, half a month off. You know, even we the most we ever did was like a 50% off your first month, which, yeah. which still is super generous. But when you're comparing that to like a free month, two free months, three right. free months, it's like so much that I called up the guy and I was like, man, I'm like, what are you doing with three months for free? And he's like, oh – I didn't even know they were doing that, like the marketing team, because I don't know. He claimed he was disconnected from it. But at the end of the day, like for better or for worse. So did they have an answer for you about that? What about why they were doing it? Yeah, it was it just because they had so much money in the bank they could just afford to. to yeah, do that? because what else are they spending the money on? Yeah. I mean, I mean that's the thing. Like you can pay yourself a great salary, but but the whole goal is just to sign up more people. And you know it's it's an addictive it's an addictive drug. Like if you give out a fifty per, you know fifty percent discount and you're like oh you know the conversion rate on the on the landing page is like seven percent when we do that. Well, let's increase it. What happens if we give a free month? Oh, it goes up to eleven percent. Oh, and they you know they, it's like the slippery slope, right. and they have so much cash. So, anyways, these guys just threw a huge amount of money, and what that did is they devalued their own product. Because when you give something to someone for free, what's the value of it? It's zero because it's free. Well, what happens if you give someone three months of it for free? Well, you, they basically trained anyone that was interested in a subscription snack box yeah. that 
you should get it for free for three yeah. months. Right. So, so then you go to my website where I'm bootstrapping this thing, and I, I only, you know, I had, like I said, I had some money, but compared to these, you know, thirty million dollars, like right. it's like, it's like I'm in this little, you know, like little twenty foot sailboat, and I'm, I'm going by like the USS Nimitz class, like you know, aircraft carrier. I mean, it was just, I, I was like this little thing, and and they had, you know, these massive guns, yeah. and I'm yeah. like, shit, how can I beat them? Well. Right. It's hard to beat, you know. It's hard. It's hard to compete with someone that is that well capitalized. So um, I pivoted the business a little bit, and um, you know we're still here and we're we're still around. But to answer your question about what was really tough, what was tough was that it took me a while to realize what was going on. And like I told you, I was burning money to get to that critical mass where we could at least like right. break even and make money. Right. But I was doing that simultaneously to these other people that were pouring so much money in. So, so I overspent, and um, I never ran out of money. Like I told you, that was the dictum. But I mean, there was a time when um, I mean I couldn't pay my bills, and I I was always able to pay the team, and people took pay cuts. Um, but I mean, there was vendors I couldn't pay, yeah. and it was very humbling, and it was it was a great teacher. To have to like get on the phone with somebody who you know we've been ordering stuff and stuff and stuff and say look, you know, my bad here. Like I, I misjudged and 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 I can't mm. pay you and I want to pay you yeah. and I'm gonna pay you, but right now I can't. And um, yeah. Yeah. we ended up paying everybody and it, we made it through. But uh, you know that was a really that was a really big learning experience. So it was just being as transparent as possible with the vendors to tell them kind of the situation. Yeah, but I mean, I think that advice works with everything in life, you yeah. know. I mean, I mean, the truth really will set you free. And I wasn't trying to screw anybody. Right. And um, you know, I kind of told them. And I mean, I, I created payment plans with people, and I said, "Look, I may owe you a thousand bucks. You know, I'll pay you a hundred. Yeah. And I'll try to pay pay a hundred every every you know um, every month until we can pay it down. Uh, but yeah, I mean, being, being transparent with people and. I mean, I had an advantage that that people were also getting a, a very good promotional value by participating with us. Yeah, that was actually something that we we always did differently, and we still do differently than than a lot of these guys. Is that they would just kind of solicit vendors for free product, and they'd say, "Hey, can you donate some stuff?" Well, when you do that, one, you're not in control of what you get, and two, you're usually getting the worst stuff because it's like, "Oh, this stuff's going to expire next month. Like, give it to the subscription box people." I always remember I started this based off of a quality thing. Right. I always wanted to maintain the quality. So we always bought the product from our vendors. You know, we'd say, hey, you got to give us a good price right. because you're going to get a marketing benefit. And look at, you right. know, Nature, Bo Nature Box doesn't do this, but like Conscious Box wants it for free. So, you know, it wasn't so bad. But yeah, if you get into a tough situation, I mean, I mean you got to be honest with your vendors and you also have to be honest with yourself. That's one of the biggest problems people have. Is that they'll lie to themselves about what they're doing and their ability to pay. So if you can just keep it real, I mean, it is what it is, right? It, it doesn't necessarily feel good when you're, you know, having to kind of go through that. But I, I was able to keep the perspective that, and the narrative I told myself was like, okay, you got these great ideas, you're working really hard, this is gonna work, and you're gonna be a success. Yeah. And like once that happens, like you're probably gonna be a success. Like maybe forever, hopefully, you know. Like yeah. once you get up there, like you know, Donald Trump isn't a, not. Oh my God, I want to you know if I should compare myself to him, but he's not <laughs> going to be. He's not going to be running out of money, even if one of his businesses goes bankrupt. You know what I'm saying? He's going to kind of like transcend that. Yeah. That that piece. Yeah. So I tried to look at that time as like, okay, this is my time. Like when I'm almost out of money and I have to like grovel at my vendors and I have to like go through this. And this was like the gym. It was like, it was like kind of that part of it, building that character as an entrepreneur and having yeah. that experience was like getting that plugged into me yeah. to like, okay, you got to get the scarcity experience. You can't just yeah. have all abundance because right. then you're going to be a spoiled bitch. So we're going to take all your money away. <laughs> you got to like all these difficult conversations and like cut everybody's salaries. And now if you know, I have an employee that comes to me, and says, "Oh, look, you know, my student loans. I, I, I need to, you know, be paid more. I, whatever." I can say, "Well, look, I know what it's like to be out of money, so I, you know, what I mean, I can talk at that level." Right. So it's that your was like a low badge, badge of honor type of thing. 
Yeah, exactly. Right. That kind of, I, I think it's, for me, it was important to have that experience. So that was kind of like, like a low point. Um, and then, uh, I'd say that I'd say the high point, not that it's like, I can crystallize it into one specific like moment that I could describe, but, but I, I remember being in the office one day recently and just kind of like looking around and I, there was just so many people like happily buzzing around and making things and, you know, se- making phone calls and selling and coming in and it just was like, it's working, you know, like it's all just like just flowing like as the opposite of what we, the experience I just described, where it was like, "Holy shit! Like, how am I even gonna, you know, I don't, I don't want to answer the phone because it's gonna be some vendor like yeah. telling me I owe the money." Yeah. To then be like, "Okay, wow! Like, it's all gonna work out. It's it, happily ever after. Like, we're in that moment of, you know, it's flowing, um, and and just kind of like letting that experience be a visceral experiential ex- experience versus knowing it and just kind of like being in that uh, in that moment." I just I go back to that space, um, and that's really been the best. Yeah, Joe, this has been absolutely fantastic, and uh, I just thank you so much for spending the time and energy and your your wisdom uh, with us. So hopefully we'll do it again. Great. Hopefully we'll see you on many uh, Joe Rogan at some point, and and uh, much more. And I'm coming back to finish up the rest of your questions. There's. I will have many more questions for you. If you're up for it, I'm up for it. So yeah, we'll do the uh, we'll do the uh, the more esoteric, uh, you know, more 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 risky version. Yeah, like it, I, it, yeah, the more risky <laughs> version is cool. And you know, it's just there's so many questions. Even the LinkedIn profile, I could have talked for an hour about. You know, because you describe yourself as entrepreneur, inventor, yogi, mystic. You know, each one of yeah. those, you know, the mystic part is probably like a whole. What does mystic mean? To you? I don't know. That I was going to ask why you put mystic. Um, I mean, mystic to me, obviously, I saw that that visual of you with the skulls, um, and I, I was, and I read a little bit about uh, someone posted, "Are you with the shaman or something?" So I picture like um, just spiritual using crystals or the universe. I'm not, you know, that's what I visualize. Nothing concrete. Okay. Yeah. Uh, should I go into? Yeah, go ahead. Go, go. Um, okay. Well, so so mystic to me yeah. means that it's someone like okay, uh, the shaman that I ref my shaman down in Peru. Put it this way, I'm like, you know, what is what is shamanism? And he's like, well, in religion, you basically have these people that say they can talk to God. So, like, the Pope is, like, God's person here or whatever. Yeah. And then the priests, like, are able to, like, you know, so they liaise between you and Carry God or this intermediary thing. Yeah. Whereas a shaman is someone that would say, instead of, like, saying, like, God t- says you should do this, the shaman will say, well, if you want to know what God says – why don't you go ask them? I'll help you get there. Mm. So they try to just take you directly to the source wow. versus like wow. being this intermediary person in between. And to me, that is the role of the mystic. It's the person that goes direct to the divine mm. and mm. seeks out the wisdom directly. And uh, there's a bunch of different technologies that exist to allow people to have these mystical experiences, whether they're uh, isolation tanks certain breathing or pranayams or psychedelic medicines and drugs. Right. So there's right. different ways to activate kind of the mystical experience. Um, and I, I'm a fan of doing that. That's a great way of describing it. Yeah. So when will be your next mystic journey? Uh, I mean, I, I meditate daily. So, I mean, there's, there's different levels of, of that commuting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, like, for example... Yoga uh, translates into union, yeah. and to me, like the true definition of yoga, what people think of it as in America, uh, you know, warrior one stretching, and it is those things. But mm. really, it's union, and it's the union of the individual self with the universal self. So, so yeah. the so one be- becoming one with God, yeah. that meeting of the two. Um, yeah. 
And so that's to me what my yoga practice is. It, it's yeah. it's working yeah. at dissolving the, my ego, my identity, and commuting with with everything. Um, so you can do that with a meditation and just trying to release from the thoughts and the and the observer that is you. Yeah. Uh, but then you can also do you know, very powerful psychedelic medicines that really ensure that's going to happen at a massive scale for a long time. Um, so I try to do those on a heartbeat. Um, hmm. You know, the funny thing about these drugs is, is they say you're, you're going to become a drug addict. When you do these really powerful medicines, like you're not racing to go back and do them again. I mean, it, they're very intense, and usually you need a lot of time to kind of process them and understand the the enormity of the experience. So, um, you know, probably in the summer we'll we'll do another deep. You're like dive. next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, cool. This was really fun. Oh, and awesome. You've got a great way of drawing you know, people out. And uh, thank you so much for having me Thanks, on the show. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate it. 